So you remember, go watch a previous session. We talked about the Holy Spirit being fountain of living waters and how this demonstrates the Holy Spirit is Yahweh. So the Father is Yahweh, the Son is Yahweh, the Holy Spirit is Yahweh. So let's go here. So let's prove it again, because now I'm going to make a connection with water and spirit. You're going to see repeatedly throughout Scripture, water and spirit connected. Water and spirit, spirit and water. And the spirit is also described like water being poured out. Okay, I need you to listen. Okay. Okay, so I need you to listen. You distract, I'll get you out of here. Class has begun. Let the spirit work through me. From the first start of creation, the Holy Spirit has worked with water. The Holy Spirit has been connected with water. So you see this repeated pattern throughout Scripture. So I want to blow you away how miraculous the Bible is, that it's miraculously structured. God used different human authors inspired by the Holy Spirit and moved them in such a way to incorporate their, incorporate their personalities, but to move them to write down God's words in human language and to place these connections there to show you its miraculous consistency because the Bible is supernatural. It's one of the proofs that the God of the Bible is real. This book is supernatural. It is. The collection of books, the God of this collection is the true God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember this in the previous part. According to Jeremiah 17, 13, who is the fountain of the living water? Yahweh. O Yahweh, the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away on earth will be written down because they have forsaken the fountain of living water, even Yahweh. Now watch the connection. If Yahweh is the fountain of living water, that means he's a source of water, of life. He is the source of life. He will thirst your quench and preserve you forever. Now, I'll break down the metaphor of water in a minute. But if Yahweh is the fountain of living water, then what does it say about the Holy Spirit? Here, John 7, 38 to 39. John 7, 38 to 39. What does it say about the Holy Spirit? He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Not physical water, spiritual water. Because water here stands for what? But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were going to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Here's another line of evidence that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Father and the Son, he himself is Yahweh. Because if he is the rivers of living water, may the Lord speak to my throat and bless my neighbors. Make my voice pleasing to your ears. But the fountain of living water is Yahweh. You just proved Yahweh is Father, Yahweh is Son, Yahweh is Holy Spirit. Father is Yahweh, Son is Yahweh, Holy Spirit is Yahweh. Not three Yahwehs, but not the same person. So here's proof for the deity of the Holy Spirit, right? Lord, protect me. Right? Here's proof. But let me show you the connection with spirit and water. The Holy Spirit has been working with water, identified associated water from the beginning. You ready? Yes, you won, Mr. Scrappy, but just focus, brother. It's not about winning. It's about glorifying Christ. Please don't change the subject. From the beginning, right? From the time of creation, spirit and water are associated because the spirit works with water to bring life both biologically and spiritually. Because I'm going to go deep now. Let's go deep. All right. Let's hear it. Genesis 1, 2. But watch here. Okay. Let's go deep. Ready? We're going to make a lot of connection. You're going to, I promise you, it's going to be a feast today. May the Lord keep us awake and attentive and destroy distractions. Okay. It's going to be a feast. What day is it? want to see none of you and me. All of the people. And I don't know why. I don't know why I'm singing. Just, I have no idea. I got mental issues. All right, here, Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. It was the void of life. It's a prebiotic stage. Darkness was over the first surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Here, you see, in the initial creation, the Holy Spirit took the watery surface. And from that watery surface, produce life on earth. 
Seeing it? Connection number one. And it starts in the first book of the Bible. Okay. Do we see in these connections before I move on? So you see how the Holy Spirit is identified as water? Water is used as a metaphor for the Spirit because the Spirit has been working with water, through water from the beginning. Hence, water baptism and the connection with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Ezekiel 36, I said 25, 27, dude. My goodness, why does even the computer can't keep up with me? Oh, hold on. Right? Right here. Ready? Okay, Ezekiel 36, 25, 27. Another connection with water and spirit. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. This is one of the passages where the Roman Catholic Church will use. When I say Roman, it's to distinguish from the other Catholic branches. Orthodox Catholic, Assyrian, Apostolicos, Catholic Church. You understand. Oriental, or Orthodox Catholic, because they all use the term Catholic, Catholicos. So you understand that, right? All right. I will sprinkle, this is where they get it from, clean water on you. Catholics, you ever wonder where? Why was he deleted, Masihi? Masihi, Joseph Arun is a regular. Masihi, Muhammad Rajim. He's a regular. He means well. Recognize the regulars. We got it? Everyone got it? All right. Sprinkle clean water on you. Okay. And you'll be clean. I will cleanse you from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. More of all, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. See, connection with water and spiritual rebirth, being a new creation. And I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of, heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. See the connection? God's spirit, water being sprinkled on you to cleanse you of your idolatry. To give you a new heart, new spirit. Right? See right there? Clean water, Holy Spirit. New spirit, new heart, new creation, new birth, regeneration. They're all connected. Ezekiel 36, 25, 27. They're all connected, right? How many of you were not aware of this passage? Not how many of you were aware. How many of you did not know about this passage? Which is one of the texts used. I know because when I was a staunch anti-Catholic, I tried to explain this away. Okay, so there you go. So God's spirit dwelling in you, clean water being sprinkled on you, resulting in you having a new heart, new spirit, being regenerated, renewed, and being cleansed of idolatry. Cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to do my judgments. Right? So we got it, right, before I move on? All right, now, so another passage where spirit, water are connected, seen working together. All right, how about here? Isaiah 32, 14, 15. Okay. Because the palace has been abandoned, the populated city forsaken, hill and watchtower have become caves forever, right? A joy for wild donkeys and pasture for flocks until the Spirit is poured out. Notice, the Spirit is being depicted as a liquid being poured out. Spirit poured out. Do you see it? The language of pouring. Well, what do you pour out? You pour out liquid. You pour out water. And here, the Spirit is being likened to water poured out because what does He do? Spirit is poured out upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful orchard. So a wilderness, a desert becomes full of trees and vegetation see the connection it's being likened to water right being poured out and the wilderness becomes a fruitful orchard and the fruitful orchard is counted as a forest other references to the spirit let's just go there take it easy man. take it easy take it easy take it easy okay just to show you, let's go here. 
Speak from the book of Yahweh and read. Not one of these will be missing. Not one will lack its mate. For his mouth has commanded and his spirit has gathered them. See, the work of the spirit in gathering God's people, uniting them. Keep that in mind. The work of the spirit. Here. Isaiah 44, 1 of 3. Now watch this one. Watch this one. Verse 3. Isaiah 44, 1 of 3. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says Yahweh, who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, another name for Israel, whom I have chosen. For I will pour out water on the thirsty ground, streams on the dry land. I will pour out my spirit. You see how the spirit is likened to water? Just like water is poured out, spirit is poured out. God will pour out water on the earth and pour out the spirit on Israel's seed and my blessing on your offspring. Are you seeing this connection? It's deliberate. It's not accidental. That's why you shouldn't be surprised that our Lord then said, if you need, if you want to be born again, born anew, regenerated, you must be born of water and spirit. Jesus answered, John 3, 3 to 5, and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you, one is born of water and spirit, he cannot en enter into the kingdom of God. Notice the connection. The original creation was made with water by the Holy Spirit. Watch the connection. Okay, watch where I'm going to go here. You want deep, right? Now, by the way, if you're listening, this shows you the Holy Spirit is God. Why? If you're paying attention. What attributes must the Holy Spirit have to be able to give life, create, recreate, restore, regenerate, replenish, and make dead things come to life? And he does this throughout the whole earth, for the earth, and humans. That means he's almighty. He's present everywhere, omniscient. He's the creator. So are you making that connection or no? No, you're not getting it, Esram. Water means water baptism, dude. Are you seeing it? So again, to show you, just like in the initial creation, the Spirit used water to produce life, right? And the Spirit of God was hovering over the fruitful waters. Likewise, the Holy Spirit uses water to produce new life in you, to recreate you, regenerate you, make you alive. See the miraculous consistency? Are you seeing the miraculous consistency throughout Scripture? What a name that Miguel, you're saying? That's amazing. All right. Everyone got it? Do you see? This is why the early church was right. This is why it was the universal teaching of all Christians. Even heretics agree. Even Martin Luther agreed. God uses water baptism to pour out the Spirit. And in that act of water baptism, the Spirit makes you alive, unites you to Christ, and seals you in Christ. They were right. It's the credo Baptists and evangelicals who deny water baptismal regeneration that are incorrect. The church was right from. Day one, even Martin Luther accepted water baptismal rege regeneration. So you Protestants, the United teaching of all Christians, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, you name it, even heretics agreed water baptism is used by the Spirit to make you alive, regenerate you, and unite you to Christ. And Protestants, it's not just Catholics, Orthodox, it's the ancient church, and it's not just ancient church. Lutherans believe that. Church of Christ believes that. Anglicans believe that. I hope I'm not wrong with the Anglicans, but no, it's High Church of England, and it mimics the Catholic Church. Where did you guys come from denying that water baptism is the means used by the Holy Spirit to make you alive, unite you to Christ, and bring out your forgiveness of sins? Who, who do you think you are to come and overturn the unanimous teaching of the church for over 1,500 years? Focus, turn. We're proud that you're proud. Just take it easy. Yeah, Raphael, help me to help you. Don't chime in as much. Okay. Do you want me to make another connection? 
What did our Lord come to do? To bring about a new creation, make all things new, right? Okay. A new creation to make all things new. All right. Watch here. Let me make another correction to blow your mind away. And how was that done? It was done through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? You guys really want to get blown away and see how miraculous the Bible is and it's supernatural, it's Trinitarian? Right? Okay. Our Lord Jesus brought about the new creation. Why? Through his death and resurrection, being raised as a first fruit, being the first glorified human who's immortal, immortal guaranteeing that those who are in him will also be transformed and made immortal, and he'll transform the earth because he paid the debt. The curse will be removed. And he did it, right? Pay attention, guys. Watch here. Revelation 21, 1 to 5. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Then I saw a new heaven, new earth. New heaven, new earth, meaning the earth and the heaven being renewed, not this heaven and earth being wiped out and a heaven and earth brought in from nothing. This heaven and earth being renewed. For the first heaven, first the earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. Right? So. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, right for, the, right, for these words are faithful and true. All right, all things new. How are you renewed and made new? In Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, get ready to be in all, blown away, mind blown. Okay, get ready. Let's go through this systematically. You ready? Watch here. Get ready, dude. If you're not going to get ready, let me do it this way. Let me go this way. All right. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Now, watch here. The flood. Let's read 2 Peter 3, verses 1 to 7. Specifically 5 to 7, all right? 2 Peter 3, verse 1 to 7. Specifically 5 to 7, okay? Arianism is the belief of Arius who said that Jesus was the first creature of the Father. Take it easy. This now, beloved, the second letter, this now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, verses 5 to 7, but I want to read the context, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Aren't we experiencing that now? People saying, man, it's been 2,000 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus is coming, all right. Yet Peter prophesied this. That's one of the signs of the end. For since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Now watch. Do you know there are three earths? Let me repeat. There are three earths. Three earth ages, three earths. If you read your Bible. Earth number one is the Genesis account, Genesis 1. Earth number two is the earth that was purged and purified of evil by the flood waters. When God flooded the earth, he destroyed all evil, and then he restored the earth, he renewed it. That's the second earth or the second earth age. The third earth or earth age is when the Lord Jesus comes and will destroy and purge all evil from this earth by his fire. Okay? You with me there? You guys listening? Or if you're not listening, I'm going to get depth. Now, why will he destroy the evil 
of this earth with fire because he swore to Noah in Genesis 8 9 he would never destroy the earth by water so he won't destroy it by water but he'll destroy it by fire okay so there are three earths or three earth ages now again what does it mean three earths it doesn't mean he wiped out the first earth out of existence brought in a new one he's going to wipe this out and bring a new one no it means the same earth that was created that same earth was then purged and purified of evil made new again by water and the same earth will be made, made new made, made new once again by fire you, you get it okay three earth ages focus anglican they can reason whatever they want just like in the israelites you could have Israelite male boys circumcised and still be cut off and lose, right? Salvation. Focus. Okay, I uh, hear. For when they maintain this, to it escapes their notice that by the word of God, and the word is logos, the logos of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. That's Genesis 1, 1 and 2. Through which the world at that time was destroyed, being deluged with water. So do you notice the same water that God used to make the earth living is the same water that God used to destroy that evil world and purge it of impurity. So that world was destroyed. So now the world we are embarking marking in, this is the second earth age, the earth that was purged and purified of evil by the flood. So you're in the second earth age. The third earth age is the world to come. There'll be no more evil in it, only the righteous. And by his, by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So let's see here. Let's go here. Right. Fred, 2 Peter 3.13, same, 2 Peter. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Did you understand this teaching? That's what Revelation 21 says. But focus, Trinity, enjoy. That means the continents won't be divided. It will be one landmass, so we're all connected together. Okay, are you learning? Are you enjoying? Are you learning? When's the last time your church or your Bible caught Bible college taught you this. You're learning, guys? Please let me know you're learning. I want to be used the Holy Spirit to make you fall more in love with Jesus and be in awe of the Bible. All right. So, now, how did he destroy the first earth age, the first world? By water. That earth that he made from water, he destroyed with water. Okay, so notice water can purify, cleanse you, or it can destroy you, right? Destroy you, right? Okay. All right. Can you all fo focus on this? Watch this. How did Noah and his family knew they could now embark on dry ground and knew that the earth had been cleansed and they could now come out of the ark and walk on dry ground and enter into the second earth age, the world. Here, Genesis 8, 6 to 12. Then it happened at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made, sent out a raven, and it went out flying back and forth until water was dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove, a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of its feet. So returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. So notice the dove is in the ark, and the ark is the means by which God is protecting them from being drowned by the water. Okay, pay attention. For the water was on the surface of the earth. Then he stretched out his hand and took it and brought it into the ark to himself. 
Then he waited another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. And the dove came to him toward evening, and behold, in its beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. Now, olives is what's used to make olive oil, which is the oil used for anointing. But anyway, so Noah knew that the water was abated from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent out the dove, but it did not return to him again. So how did he know? The dove signified to him when he could embark on dry ground. The dove that was with him in the ark, the ark that was used to preserve him, his seven family members and the animals from the water that destroyed the evil of the earth. Right? Right? Watch here now. Oh, no, wait, oh, wait here. And what did the Spirit use to create the initial creation? Water. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Who ushered in the new creation? Jesus Christ. When he began his ministry, his death, resurrection, session, he brought in the new creation. Now watch the connection. Okay, A dove, water, spirit. Spirit and water. To make the first earth habitable, water used to then destroy the evil of the earth, cleansing it of evil, and a dove signifying to Noah and his family, you can now embark on this new world. Okay, watch here. The beginning, notice, the beginning of the gospel, the good news. This is now the start of the good news that Jesus, the Son of God, has come to bring in a new creation. But when did he begin his ministry? Watch here. Watch here, Vascon. Watch here. Everyone. Now it happened that in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, was baptized by John and Jordan, and immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit, like a dove descending upon him. There you go. The new creation involving the new Adam where the Holy Spirit descends as a dove as he comes out of the water, signifying a new creation has begun. You see it? And a voice came out of the heavens, you are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. You see it or no? Got it? Genesis 1, 1 and 2. The Spirit used water to create the first earth. You read Genesis 6, 7, and 8. God used water to destroy the earth of evil and impurities. And what was the sign that Noah and his family and the animals could now embark on a new earth that had been cleansed by water? The dove. The dove was with them. What marked the beginning of Jesus' ministry? The last Adam who brings in a new creation. What marked it? His baptism. That's when his ministry begins. He comes out of the water. And who comes down as a dove? The spirit. Because here is the dove. Here is the spirit involved in the creation and recreation of the earth. And notice Jesus is God's son whom God delights in. Sent to now bring in a new creation as the last Adam. Now, what's interesting is he's the last Adam. He's the son of God, right? Watch here. What about the first Adam? Luke 3, 21, 23. Now it happened. Okay. Now it happened. How many of you are like blown away, like shocked? Luke 3, 21, 23. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was open. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. There it is. And a voice came out of them, you are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. And then he begins his ministry of bringing a new creation. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being as it was supposed, the son of Joseph, son of Eli. But who is the first Adam? Luke 3.38. Son of Enosh, son of Seth, son of Adam, son of God. Son of God. See it? Son of God. 
But uh, did you notice again what's present? And bringing in the new creation, water, right? Holy Spirit, right? What's involved? Water, Holy Spirit, and the new creation, right? Right here. Coming up out of the water, here is the Spirit working with water, right? As the man comes out, who's the last Adam, to begin the recreation of the heavens and the earth. Water and Spirit, water and Spirit. Water and spirit. You seeing the connection? But now watch this other connection. First Peter 3, 21. I'm sorry. First Peter 3, 18 to 22. Watch here. Watch another connection. You ready? Go deep. <laughs> uh, Vasquez, are you blown away? Ready, go deep. Good. Thank you. All right. You see, your ancient churches were always right. I was wrong. The Baptists misled me with good intentions. Water baptism is part of the work of saving you. The Spirit will use your water baptism, make you spiritual alive, and unite you to Christ. I was wrong. I didn't know. I was wrong. I was wrong. How blessed are you that you guys didn't have to leave your churches to discover your churches were right. The Oriental, Eastern Orthodox, the Assyrian Church, Catholic Church, you guys were right. I had to spend 20 years to end up realizing you guys were right, I was wrong. Right? How blessed, but you take it for granted. First Peter 3, 18 and 22, watch. For Christ also suffered for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now watch the connection with Noah. Watch. Don't ask me a question about the spirits here. That's not the topic, please. I'll do some a session out later, which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. These are the spirits that are now in prison. Why? Because they were disobedient. When? When the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, sorry, I got to sneeze, were brought safely through water. Did you catch it? Oh, hold on. <coughs> Excuse me. Now notice. The two elements, Noah, his seven family members and the animals saved through water. But they needed to be in the ark. Saved through water, needed to be in the ark. So being in the ark, they were saved through water. Now that water did what? Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Did you catch it? The water that they were saved through is a sign symbol of your water baptism which also saves you this was a nightmare for me when i didn't believe in water baptismal regeneration let me put it on the screen you see it just like they were saved through water and that water is a symbol of something greater your water baptism so your water baptism saves you I'm going to make the connection in a minute. Just let's go a little deep. You see it? Yes, it counts if it was in a valid apostolic church, Brelex. All right. But what does it save you from? Not washing the germs off your body. That's what you get when you take a shower. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh. That's what you get when you take a shower. But an appeal of a good conscience to God. When you come by faith, and a clear conscience, come to God, trusting that God will honor this water baptism. And you take him at his word, and you go ahead and do it, you'll be saved. Why? Because the resurrection of Christ procured these graces. Because of Christ's resurrection, 
These saving graces are guaranteed to work for those who believe and are not double-minded. It all hinges in the resurrection of Christ. See it? I hope so, JT. May he confirm that. See it? Esram, don't, don't ask me very rare situations that are not common. God will see your heart, and if he sees that your heart, you want to get baptized, but you didn't, then that's called the baptism of desire, and the Lord will then credit that to you. Just take it easy. Focus. Yes, then you're okay, Bray. Your baptism is valid. Now walk in your baptism. 1 Peter 3, 18 and 22, Risen Studio. 1 Peter 3, 18 and 22. Okay, you with me there? All right, now watch this. What does it mean through the resurrection? If there is no death and resurrection, nothing you do will benefit you. It's all void. No. It is Jesus, his death and resurrection, your faith in him that makes your water baptism effectual, powerful, doing what God said will be done. It is Jesus that makes your Eucharist effectual, eff efficacious, effectual. It is Jesus who makes your alms, your prayers, your deeds, acceptable and pleasing without the death resurrection life of our lord none of that would work nothing nothing so it's all based anchored in the life death resurrection glorification of our lord his life death resurrection glorification guarantees and ensures that these saving graces will work for those who trust in him Bunny, you got to go and ask the Catholic Orthodox Church. Don't ask me. Don't change subject. You with me there? We get it? All right. Now, let me go a little deeper. Who's at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Okay. Now, watch here. It says, they were saved through water as they were in the ark. Notice, it's not just the water. It's the ark. Now, let me go a little deeper. How did that water save them? Can, can I share with you how it saved them? What did that water do? That water purged the earth of all its evil, destroyed all evil from the earth. So the water saved Noah and his family and the animals from evil, the evil of the world. It purged the world of sin unrighteousness, and evil. Likewise, water baptism purges you of your sin, unrighteousness, ungodliness, and gives you a clean slate. But just like Noah and his family ended up sinning and spreading sin again, you too can sin, end up sinning even after your baptism. Everyone getting the connection or no? Everyone getting these connections? Right? But just like Noah and his family embarked on the earth and sin spread again because they sinned even after that, you too can sin and continue in error and sin even after your baptism. That's why there has to be confession, repentance, restoration. See how deep it goes? But notice that part of it includes the ark. Now let's look at the word for ark. Let me just double check. Just watch what's going to happen. All right, watch here. Take it easy, guys. Take it easy. And then I'm going to go into John. We're not done. This is all part of John. Thank you, Stafford. You guys see when Stafford, or we should thank Kelly for being stupid to egg on Stafford to then do this. Thank you, Kelly, for being stupid. We appreciate you, sir. All right. Let's enlarge it. The ark, right? Kibo tu. The ark. Thank you, jackass. <laughs> All right, let's see. Kibotus, wooden box. A wooden box. Let me just see lexically its range of meaning. The ark and the flood. Wooden box. The ark of the covenant. You see why I wanted to show you this? You see this word ark? Guys, let's go deep. The ark of the covenant. 
See what I wanted to show you? The Ark of the Covenant, Revelation 11, 19. Same Greek word, right? Do you see it? Guys, do you see it? Where I'm going with this. Do you see the word Ark? It's used in Hebrews 11, 7, for the Ark of the Covenant. I'm sorry, this is used for the Ark of Noah, my, my apologies, and the Ark of the Covenant. Now let's line them all up, shall we? Watch here. We're going to line them all up. Now I can't do it here. One second. Watch where we're going to go with this. Watch the connection with Jesus and his body. Okay, ready? Okay, Hebrews 9, 4, 11, 7. This is Noah. All right, First Peter 3, 20, Revelation 11, 19. Okay, watch here. Same word, ark, right? Having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant, the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, and which was a golden jar holding the manna, and Aaron's rod, which budded and the tablets of the covenant. The ark of the covenant. That's the mercy seat where the throne of God was placed behind the veil in the most holy place, holy of holies, the Ark of the Covenant. And there it contained the golden jar of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, the tablets of stone with God's commands. Okay, right here. Golden jar of holding uh, holding the manna, golden altar of incense, Aaron's rod which budded tablets of the covenant. Okay, same word. What happened here, dude? What the heck happened? That's why. Same word used for Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark. Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, Noah, being warned about things not yet seen, and reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household. So the ark was used to save him. They had to be in the ark to be saved. By which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according faith. But hold on, the same one here. 1 Peter 3.20, who once were obedient, disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting and the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Ark of Noah, which is the same word used for the Ark of the Covenant. Revelation 11.19. And the sanctuary of God, which is in heaven, is open. And the Ark of His Covenant appeared in a sanct sanctuary. Same Greek word. And there were flashes of lightning. And sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. Anyone see the connection or no? The Ark of the Covenant. Who is Jesus? The physical temple, tabernacle of God. His physical body is the temple of God. Who lives in that physical body? God in all his fullness. So our Lord's physical body is the temple in which is the Ark of the Covenant. And you need to be in Christ to be saved. So you're in Christ through water. Because in water baptism, you're connected to Christ. Do you see how deep it goes? I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to prove it to you. We are making beauties, huh? Making the beauties. You get it? Watch here. Jesus is the temple. You got to be in Christ, in the temple, in the ark, in the ark to be saved. You don't, you don't leave me? Okay, here you go. And when you are born of the spirit through water, you are now part of that temple. You are one with him. I know you guys don't believe me because you're all skeptics. Okay. John 2, 19 to 22. You see how it ties in now with water baptism? In water baptism, the Holy Spirit makes you one with Christ in the Spirit. And being one with Christ in the Spirit, you are now in the ark that saves you. Let me go a little deeper. Yeah, there will be connections, Savior. Like the manna is Jesus. He's the living bread. The tablets of stone, the words of God. And Jesus is the word of God. Right? The incense is prayer because incense and prayer, right? Prayer is likened to incense. And the rod that budded, 
that would also be God's ruling staff. Yeah, it goes deep. We got it or no? You guys enjoying this or you're asleep? That bore you to death? Lopat to everyone else? Here. Who is Jesus and what is his physical body? Jesus answered, destroy this sanctuary. In three days, I'll raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this sanctuary. And you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the sanctuary of his body. Sanctuary of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remember that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now, when you're born of the Spirit through water, notice the connection. Noah and his family and the animals were saved in the ark through water, ark and water. You are saved in the ark through water because it's through water that the Spirit uses you to then unite you to Christ, becoming his spiritual body. Here, you don't think so? 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17. Right? Watch here. Do you not know that you are a sanctuary of God? And here it is. And that the Spirit dwells in you. Notice the Spirit. Notice the Spirit making you the sanctuary of God, uniting you to Christ. If any man destroys the sanctuary of God, God will destroy him. The sanctuary of God is holy, and that is what you are. All right. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 20, talking about why you cannot commit fornication or adultery or homosexuality. Because when you use your body to engage in sexual morality, you're defiling your union with Christ because you're one spirit with him. So what you do with your body affects your union with Christ. And Christ will not be defiled by your sexual immorality. So you better be careful what you do with your body. It's right here. 1 Corinthians 6, and it's also in Ephesians 5, 30 to 32, right here. All things are lawful for me, meaning I can eat steak, pork, ham, but that doesn't mean it's profitable. Because if my freedom in eating what I want will cause a weaker brother to sin and stumble, God will punish me for misusing my freedom. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Nothing will control me except God. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. The Lord is using your body. Why do you think I say we are the hands and feet, the mouthpiece of God? Because God, Father, Son, and Spirit are using your body, working through your body to bring about his will. Now, God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? Don't you dare enter into a physical sexual union that is forbidden? Or don't you dare enter into spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery by worshiping other gods and goddesses because then you're defiling your union with Christ because you're one spirit with him. Focus. So what's the point? Are you the temple of God? Are you the sanctuary of God? Yes. Because when you're with Christ, you're one spirit with him. You become a spiritual body and Christ's physical body is the temple. That means you're now in the ark. You caught it? You're in the ark. You are in the ark. And your inner man is God's mercy seat because he dwells in you. You're in the ark. So notice the connection with Noah, the ark, and the flood. Noah, his family and animals were saved through water in an ark from the evil that plagued the world. You are saved through water, which connects you to Christ, the Ark of the Covenant, the temple, and being one with him in spirit. And where is Jesus? He's seated at the right hand of God. He's seated in the mercy seat in the heavenly temple. Well, where are you? Ephesians 2, 6. 
Where are you? Ephesians 2 6. Point, focus, guys. Don't engage each other. Ephesians 2 6. And God raised us up with Jesus and already seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Did you know that? If you're one with Christ in the spirit, you're one with him in spirit in his body. That means positionally, you're already seated with him in heaven. You're in the Holy of Holies on the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant. You caught it? Are you seeing how Noah's flood, the ark, all pictures of water baptism, destroying the evil, the sin, ungodliness from your flesh, and your union with Christ, the temple of God, where you become the temple of God and God now dwells in you, the Ark of the Covenant, all connecting? Is it all connecting or no? Making sense? See how deep it is? See, so from the beginning, spirit and water, spirit and water, spirit and water. Spirit uses water to bring life on the earth. Spirit used the water to purge the earth of evil. Spirit uses water to purge you of your sin and recreate you and unite you to Christ. Spirit and water, spirit and water. You're in the ark. Exactly. And again, your body is not yours, right? Your body is not yours. Right? Do, or do you not know that your body stands with the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have formed God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, therefore God, glorify God in your body. Your body is not yours. Your body belongs to the Lord, and the Lord wants to use your body. So let me give you two more passages. Now we're going to go into I am statements. You guys are all right? This is the night is still young for me. Unless you're tired. Okay, let me show you this. Here you go again. Well, let me do this first. Watch here. Let's go here. How do you become one with Christ? How do you become a spiritual body and Christ is in you? By the way, Tony, are you here? Azizi? Agamini. Here you go. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 14. Pay attention to verse 13. 13. Watch here. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 14. Okay? Watch here. Ponto, are you being blown away by this? Blessed? For even as the body is one, yet it has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For also by one spirit, you are all baptized. Hello? Spirit and water into one body. So the spirit through water unites you to the ark. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. For also the body's not one member, but many. Right? Galatians 2.20. Remember I said we are the mouthpiece, hands and feet of our Lord? Where did I get that from? Here. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. See? Your body is his. He owns it. He now wants to live his will through your body. He wants you to let him use your mind. Your thoughts, your mouth, your tongue, your words, your hands, your feet, your eyes to fulfill his will. He's still living his life on earth through us until he returns. Galatians 2.20, right? Right? And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, or by the faith of the Son of God, His faithfulness, who loved me and gave Himself up for me. See how deep, miraculous, supernatural your Bible is? And you see why the early Christians, the fathers, the theologians, were brilliant. They had no Bible app, no Bible software, no lexicons. They didn't have a Bible between two covers. And yet they knew the Bible much better than us, putting us to shame and humiliation. Can you imagine what they have done with the technology we have? The things they saw.
you see, you Orthodox, and I mean this, you Catholic, Syrian Church, you have traditions that are anchored in the sound exegete scriptures, championed, defended, and died for by holy men, appointed by the apostles as the Spirit moved them to appoint them and their successors. You Protestants are lost. The Reformers misled you and caused you to fall away from this fullness.